but our big topic for tonight is uh, the village of Noble Weeding, which is a, a six to eight hundred year old Native American village um, in McLean County, um, so just a little ways west of here, that um, last year we uh, started a, a research project there with um, some folks from just down the road, the Illinois State Archaeological Survey, many of which are in the room, so you may be able to match up some of these pictures with some of the faces sitting next to you. Um, so they were, were wonderful uh, collaborative partners in the project, and they, they produced um, a number of the, the fancy images that we're going to see here. And I, I provided the uh, student labor, I guess, out there. Uh, and so we're going we're to talk about a... Um, just a summary of, of what we found, uh, why we're doing it, we'll kind of situate it in, in the broader picture of what's happening here in Illinois. And, uh, yes, well, just after a thousand or so years ago. So let's start way back. Uh, and please don't, don't strain yourself on trying to read this. Uh, we'll go through the, the color-coded stuff here. So um, as archaeologists, we're, we're studying uh, the human past here uh, of Illinois. And the human past in Illinois goes back somewhere around 13 to 15,000 years ago uh, into what we call this blue area, the Paleo-Indian period. This is the end of the last ice age. Uh, the glaciers are melting and retreating and carving out what is now the Great Lakes. Uh, the Mississippi River is kind of forming, uh, largely kind of the, the way it looks today. There's a lot of um, crazy looking stuff out there. There are a lot of extinct uh, things like uh, mammoths and mastodons and giant ground sloth and big giant bears and uh, giant bison and stuff like that. And this is the environment that the very first Illinoisans, the very first North Americans, uh, head into. And then the kind of reddish brown area here uh, is the biggest chunk of time we call the Archaic Period. This is when people are kind of settling in, the Ice Age ends, uh, and stuff looks a little more modern. We get the same kind of trees and, and plants and animals that we see out there. People are hunters and gatherers, so they're getting their food uh, entirely from wild sources. Living in relatively small groups, they move around the landscape quite a bit. Um, this is a time when we don't really talk about, you know, villages, um, relatively small, small sites, relatively mobile people. Until the very end of this period, um, then we have the first evidence that people are modifying their environment in such a way that they now have crops. Uh, and so we can't call them full-scale agriculturalists, but they are growing some of their own food. Uh, by the time we reach the end of this period, about you know, three, 4,000 years ago, with that we get the first evidence of, of pottery, of ceramic technology that comes in largely to, to cook and to store uh, these new foods that, that people are um, really exploiting intensively at this time, which leads us into the blue, or the, excuse me, the green period here that we call the woodland period. This is when, when mo many of the mounds uh, are being built throughout Illinois and surrounding states, people are settling down a little more. They're relying more and more on these crops that they're growing until the end of this period uh, when we get um, new crops moving in uh, that are, are initially domesticated down in Central America, maize, beans, and squash, the three sisters, the things that we typically associate with Native American agriculture. Those are, these are tropical plants that make their way up through the Southwest and over here to a place like Illinois, somewhere around about a thousand years ago. Uh, and with this, now we start to get bigger sites. People are settling down more and more. This is when we get you know, the bigger villages um, that are popping up. And this time period of about a thousand years ago really is where our story starts to really pick up. So before we start to noble weeding, we have to go down to southern Illinois. Uh, to the big thing that's happening here, uh, the site of Cahokia. So Cahokia is, is literally the biggest thing that ever happens in, in throughout the entire history of, of North America, uh, pre-Columbian history of, of North America here. Um, it's the first city in this part of the world, really you know, north of, of the Maya world in Central America. It has a uh, monk's mound which is the biggest construction uh, up until the, the industrial age, uh, where some other things are, are built that are bigger. The biggest thing ever built here, all piled up, essentially one basket full of soil at a time with, with people who are working with um, 
you know, digging sticks and, and non-industrial technology there. They build Monk's Mound. They build uh, 120 or so mounds uh, around Monk's Mound in the, kind of the center of what we call Cahokia here. Um, but it, it's connected to this larger area um, that includes sites uh, in East St. Louis as well as St. Louis, uh, there were, where we have dozens more mounds. Um, somewhere around you know, 10 to 15,000 people are living in the immediate vicinity and, and quite a few more uh, as you go kind of farther out from the site. So it's a really big thing. So think of Illinois today, you know, Chicago, everything is up north and we have downstate. Well, flip Illinois on its head, everything was focused down here on Cahokia. That's where the big, sit, big city is. And then you can think of like upstaters uh, out of here away from Cahokia. So it's a, it's a really big thing. And um, the, the, uh, just the idea of Cahokia and what's going on there is drawing in all sorts of people, not only from the immediate area, but from uh, even outside of, of what is today Illinois. And so we get thousands upon thousands of people uh, who are moving in here to where, where before Cahokia exists, there were you know, relatively small villages you know, kind of scattered throughout the area. Suddenly we have this big city. This all happens about a thousand years ago. Um, and Cahokia, for the first couple hundred years of its history, experiences this really big boom where you have all these people moving in. It is growing. They're building more and more mounds. They have all these, these big giant construction projects that are occurring at this time. So you see here, I just stole this from Cahokia's website, uh, what they call the, the golden age of Cahokia, between 80, 11, uh, and 1200 is when we have just the hustle and bustle, really kind of the peak of what's happening at Cahokia as, as a big social center, as a market, as a political center uh, of the state as well. So this all happens, and um, very soon after we see Cahokia kind of pop up, we see people all throughout uh, Illinois and into the southeast that are suddenly adopting a very similar kind of lifestyle that we call the Mississippian lifestyle. So uh, this is all in a time before written history, so we as archaeologists you know, kind, of, kind of label what we see going on. So we don't know what exactly the people at Cahokia called Cahokia or what they called themselves, what we call the city Cahokia, and people who live a similar lifestyle, uh, Mississippian. So essentially all these little circles you see are miniature versions uh, with their own, you know, you, unique characteristics in some ways, but kind of miniature versions of Cahokia that pop up. They're big villages with mounds uh, that kind of go all throughout the area. Again, relatively quickly, you can see these kind of lines of, of within, you know, 50 to 100 years, we see um, similar versions of this lifestyle popping up all throughout uh, the eastern half of North America. So again, just showing what a, what a big deal it is that Cahokia comes here. And so this all you know, happens for, for a couple hundred years, which depending on your, your view of time uh, could be a long time. We as archeologists tend to have a really warped view of time. So we think, oh gosh, 200 years, that's, that's a blink of an eye, uh, basically, in the grand scheme of things. And, and if you think of it in terms of comparing that to 13,000 years, yes, it's relatively short. Um, so we describe Cahokia as having this relatively short you know, 100, 200 year period where things are going really well. Well, by uh, the end of uh, the 12th century, so you see here AD 1175, there is some inkling that um, things are changing at Cahokia. And we see around Monk's Mound and the surrounding area, this big wall goes up. That you can see is, is rebuilt uh, in several stages, this big giant wooden fence uh, that has these little bastions here for, for defense through here. Um, so at some point, somebody decided, well, we need a little more protection here at Cahokia as kind of this, this initial stage is winding down. By the time you get to 1200, between about 1200 and 1300 AD, there are still people at Cahokia. It's still a big city, um, but you don't see mounds really, really being built. During this period, uh, there's, there's evidence for kind of reorganization um, you know, that's, that's going on within the society. And then by sometime after 1300 AD, Cahokia is essentially abandoned. So that by the time we get uh, historic European contact 
uh, at the site. Um, the, the original builders and occupants of Cahokia are kind of long gone uh, by this point. So again, we have a few hundred years here where Cahokia is doing really well, and then it it's, you know, changes a bit, and then we see this decline by about 1300 or a little bit after. So what does this all have to do with uh, places that are not Cahokia? Um, well, as we said, we have Cahokia pops up down here, southern Illinois, right across from, from the city of St. Louis. Um, and then we see kind of related uh, villages that are popping up all along the Illinois and Mississippi River. That's what these circular uh, spots are on here. Um, well, there are people elsewhere. Many of these people adopt you know, similar types of, of lifestyles. Um, but others seem to be certainly influenced by Cahokia. They knew of Cahokia, but they, they decided to kind of keep their distance and do things a little bit differently. Um, and so again, this is, this is before written history, so we, we don't know what exactly these people called themselves uh, or whether there are more divisions uh, than we're recognizing. But we can see basic distinctions uh, in the types of artifacts that they left behind, in this case, pottery. So we see on the left here, the upper left photo, uh, this is kind of uh, typical Mississippian pottery that we see at about the time of the site of noble weeding. Um, and so pottery is made out of clay, but they're also mixing in what we call temper to that, and that is, is usually ground or crushed up bits of some other material that help it withstand the firing and, and the cooking process and kind of strengthen the, the whole thing, kind of like, think of it like bone china uh, today. So Mississippian folks mix in crushed up river shell uh, with their pottery. So you can see the little white dots in there, that's little bits of shell. Versus on the right, uh, we have the people around here in northern Illinois, around the Chicago land area and the upper um, Illinois River, uh, near kind of the Starved Rock area. They made their pottery a little bit different. They put different decorations on it, and they also mixed in a uh, different uh, type of temper to it uh, that is essentially crushed up rocks, what we call grit temper. So these people, we call them Langford, after their, their pottery that was described um, by an archaeologist named, named Langford. So these are the triangular sites that we see here. So you can see they tend to be up here. There's about you know, 80 kilometers or so in between that, that there seems to be this, this general buffer zone where everyone said, okay, we're going to be here, you're going to be there, uh, and everybody is going to be happy. And uh, you can see out here, kind of in the middle of nowhere, uh, we can see that um, nobody tends to be out here. They tend to be closer to the main rivers except for our site, Noble Weeding. We see right here uh, in southern McLean County is, is kind of out here where we're not seeing other people. And it's certainly, even though the vast majority of things that we find at the site are these Langford ceramics that should be up here in, in northern Illinois, we do get a, a, a distinct you know, uh, minority of the shell-tempered Mississippian stuff at the site. So we have you know, kind of somehow a coming together of these different types of artifacts, potentially different types of people. So the site has been uh, known about for a number of years, about 100 years or so, uh, and there were some pretty in intensive uh, excavations there in the late 60s, early 70s uh, by Illinois Wesleyan University and Illinois State University. The ISE ones were directed by Dr. Ed Jelks, who you see here in, in the cowboy hat, and he's working with some uh, middle school students there at the site. Um, and so they went and, and kind of poked around, tried to get an idea of, of what's going on at the site. Why do we have two different types of pottery, potentially different types of people there? And, and Jelks' work was summarized uh, by who was a graduate student at the time, uh, Rose Schilt, who you see pictured here at the site last summer. Rose wrote her master's thesis on noble weeding in 1977. And then in 2017, uh, she, she came and visited us uh, from her home in Hawaii, you know, came back to central Illinois to play in the dirt exactly 40 years to the year after she wrote her thesis on the site as we have um, ongoing and continuing excavations at the site. So it was really cool to have her out there and have kind of that historic perspective going on. So we knew a little bit about the site, kind of going into it based on the work of, of Schilt and Jelks here. We have... Um, some uh, temporal kind of designations at the site. They are a little bit um, 
kind of competing here. You see that these radiocarbon dates, so they're dating, uh, you know, burned pieces of, of wood or corn, uh, or, or in the more recent cases, beans uh, from the site. The 70s dates put the occupation of the site in the early 1200s. And again, keep in mind the, the history of Cahokia, because again, Cahokia is the big influence out there at this time. It makes a big difference, you know, plus or minus 150 years, what's going on at Cahokia, and, and which could play into why people are here at this site. So the 70s, they're saying, well, it's the early kind of 1200s. More recently, uh, some, some beans from the site have been dated to the mid uh, 1300s. So, you know, the tendency is to say, well, you know, the more recent ones are probably more correct. Ultimately, we don't know. We haven't run any new dates. Uh, based on our work yet, it's possible that they're both right and the village is just occupied for a really long period of time. Um, that's definitely one of the things that we need to sort out, is when exactly were people here at Noble Weeding, and how does that correlate with what's going on at a place like Cahokia and certainly even some of these other sites throughout the region. So we knew some stuff going into it, uh, but we didn't know uh, exactly how much was going on at the site. It's in a, an active farm field. It's been plowed for, for well over 100 years. So the question was, well, they found some stuff in the 70s. How much is really out there? Um, well, uh, this thing popped up um, and um, really showed us that, that a heck of a lot uh, is still out there. Um, and so what we have, this is from a machine uh, called a magnetometer, which you kind of see uh, at work down here. Um, and my colleague Bob McCullough here can explain it way better than I can, but it has something to do with the, the magnetism that's measured in the earth. Um, and it gives you this fun little kind of overview picture. And that's as far as I know. So if you want to know more about it, ask him. He can do it. He can explain it way better. Um, but anyway, what it does is the gray there is just kind of the natural average uh, area of, of the topsoil that's out there. And we're kind of looking at it, you know, from above. And the readings are being taken by people walking across the soil here. You can make out some, some squares or rectangles. If you go through and count them up, uh, and, and, and Bob has pulled them out here, there's somewhere around three dozen of these that are all the foundations of, of houses and other structures that would have been at the site. The other thing you see a lot of are these little black spots. These are pits that presumably would have initially been used to store corn and other things that were harvested, the food. Uh, and as that's eaten up, then they become trash pits. You fill those in so that you don't you know, fall into it in the night as you're going to the bathroom or, or something like that. It'd be a big danger to have these giant pits out there. So they're really great for us as archeologists because they offer a wonderful snapshot of uh, what people were throwing away. Trash is the best way to figure out what exactly people were doing. So we have this kind of circular village. There's a large open spot in the center. There was a burial mound here um, that was investigated really early on in the site's history, around 1900 uh, or so. We see a little bit of remnants of that. The big line at the top is actually a field road that allows us to drive right in and plop down on the site. So suddenly we, we found out that, well, well, gosh, there's a heck of a lot going on here and all sorts of, of questions can now be answered about the site. So this is the one thing I'll, I'll make you read out there, uh, and then the rest is just pretty pictures. So um, digging in the dirt is a lot of fun, and, and discovery is, is always a great part of being an archeologist, but um, we also need to have, of course, research questions going out there. So in summary, basically what, what we wanna know, number one is, why in the world were people at Noble Weeding? Why were they coming to the middle of nowhere, to a place where, where nobody lived before, that's outside kind of the traditional areas of, of especially the Langford groups that are there? And um, number two, we want to know, kind of reconcile these dates there. Was this a brief occupation? Was it a really long occupation? If it was, did it change through time? Does that maybe correlate with things that are happening at Cahokia or in Northern Illinois or, or uh, whatever it may be? And then of course, we're gonna talk about bigger questions about what happens when different types of people come together that, that normally kind of kept their distance from each other and um, how do they kind of negotiate uh, what's going on out there and how do they make it work? 
So those are the things that are, that are driving us. We started uh, last year with a big giant group. Again, here you'll see maybe some familiar faces. We had 16 students from ISU, along with uh, everybody at, at ISAS who could make their way over. We were very happy to have the crew, but we had a big giant crew. So we moved uh, a heck of a lot of dirt and got a lot done as we went through. But ultimately, you know, we have our research questions. We want to know about the site. A big part of it is, is also educating the students so we can get the next generation going here of archaeologists. So what we do, we're staking out. We, we get to plop down right exactly where we want to be uh, based on this geophysical map that we have of telling us where houses are and where pits are and things like that. All, of the, all the soil that we take out of the ground goes through the screen. Um, and we pop out all of the, the fun artifacts that come out of there as well. So there's a lot of digging, there's a lot of grunt work, but ultimately it's all about recording, because once you dig it, then, then it's out of the ground and, and you're going to forget exactly where it was. So we produce just gobs and gobs of paperwork uh, as well. So there's a lot of kind of nitty-gritty um, parts to it of measuring and filling out forms, and even though you're working outside, you can never get away from from the bureaucratic part of stuff. And something we're still working on is now washing up all the artifacts, making sense of them, measuring them, weighing them, and getting that piece of the puzzle together. So even though it is a lot of work, it's a lot of tedious work, it's a lot of hard work, I do think they have a little bit of fun out there, and I certainly enjoy it, uh, getting out of the office and, and playing around out there as well. So, all right, there's a bit of the background. All right, what did we do? Well, here's our map, again, kind of looking down on the site. Um, we decided this year we're going to work close to the road, uh, just because it is an active field and we didn't want to disturb uh, too much of, of the uh, crop that is planted out there. So we decided, let's use this field road. Uh, and so um, uh, that is where we start. So what you see here on the right is a zoomed-in version of what we see on the left. So we're actually... Um, I'm usually taller than this, or this thing is shorter. So, but if you look up that way, uh, this is where this is zoomed in. And so we can see uh, there is this kind of straight line of these uh, black dots over here that we're assuming maybe are our pits. But it's also not uncommon, it's actually very common, for villages at this time to have a wall around them, similar to what we saw pop up at Cahokia. So they have this wall, they have this fence, this palisade. Um, for protection, whether it was ever used or if it was more just kind of uh, peace of mind kind of thing, um, depends on the site, but people did often build uh, a wall around the site. So we saw this kind of straight line and thought, well, maybe this is evidence for a wall around Noble Weedy. So we popped in some, some units over here. So again, what, what we do here, we're in this, this uh, cornfield. So the first, first foot or so, of soil is just kind of all churned up. There's artifacts in it, um, but you can't kind of make heads or tails of, of maybe what was there uh, in the past. But once you get past that first foot or so, you get down to essentially stuff as it looked 600 years ago, 800 years ago, whenever the site was uh, occupied. So if we find a wall, or if we, if we were going to find a wall, we would expect something like what you see up in that top picture. Uh, which, is, which again is not from the site, but you find this straight line of, of essentially fence posts. And if you compare that picture to what we have here from the site, um, you'll see we didn't have that, actually. But you can see these darker spots, the darker, more black areas. These, these are the features, these are the things that are of interest, and the more brown is just the general undisturbed subsoil. So what these things were, rather than a, a, a row of, of posts for a fence or a wall, uh, were these relatively shallow pits. You can see here we've, we've kind of cut into one. You see some, some rocks you know, popping up in there. Um, it's hard to say what exactly they were, aside from, from just calling them processing pits, which is just a general term for saying that they did stuff in them. We did find some evidence for, for, uh, for corn processing. This is um, a grinding stone. Uh, kind of popping out of there. We have, uh, we did notice a corn cob, which you can kind of make out here, this burnt corn cob, and move through and just other kind of charcoal goes through there. So we had these shallow pits. They're different from the other pits that we'll see at the site. Um, so we can say, well, there's no wall, 
um, and people were doing, you know, some sort of, of activity uh, over here. So again, the, one of the big things we took away from this side of the site was that even though we had different people coming together from different places, they chose not to build a wall seemingly at the site. We'll keep looking for more evidence, maybe we'll find it. But as of now, that's kind of our working hypothesis. So we have all these pits that kind of pop up, all the little black dots. We also, of course, have our little rectangles here. Um, these are structure foundations, and we wanted to know more about the houses, more about the daily life. What was it like to live here at Noble Weeding? So we selected one of these and in close to um, the field road up there and started stripping away the soil. You can see on this photo here, you see the plow scars that still move through, but the much darker, very artifact rich, charcoal rich soil that we see here, you get through enough of that and you start to see, you know, this is not a house, this is a house. So we can start to see maybe a corner kind of popping up through there where we're figuring out the overall footprint of this particular structure. We're finding gobs and gobs of animal bones at this point, as you can see all the little white things there are, are scattered animal bones. One of the big uh, kind of claims to fame of the site is that it has uh, a lot of elk bones. That was the kind of preferred uh, hunted game of people at the site, which you find elk bones, you know, here and there throughout uh, prehistoric sites in Illinois, but none nearly to the extent that we see here at Noble Weeding. There's also deer bones um, and some smaller mammals and plenty of fish bones and things as well, but lots and lots of these big giant elk bones, which could be part of the reason why people are coming to the site and setting up here. Maybe there were abundant elk populations in the area. So we keep stripping away and eventually we're getting uh, the outline of this house here. There it is, that we've lined it with these uh, nails with little white tape on them to kind of help um, highlight it. But you can see the darker in the middle and then the lighter on, on the outside, the darker is, is the fill of the house after it went away. It's, the, the basin has now been, been, been filled in. So it's about uh, seven meters on a side by, by six meters, so somewhere around 20 feet or so per side. Would have probably housed you know, a relatively large family. So it would have been very cozy spaces at this time, especially compared to, to our houses these days. And uh, architecturally, what they do to, to build a house, they would uh, dig out uh, what we call a basin. So it's, it's going into the ground a little bit, uh, helps with, with uh, you know, thermal regulation. It's colder in the summer and a little warmer in the winter if you're in the ground uh, a bit. So that's where you can see here, you can kind of notice the slope down and in. It's all been filled in with remains. You know, it's hard to sort out, uh, was this all stuff that was there as the house was in use, or did it all kind of come later, similar to those trash pits, you know, people are always trying to fill in holes around here. Um, so we have the house basin, and you strip that away and you get more of kind of the, the architecture, the foundation of the house that is popping up here. So uh, the way houses were built, this is a very kind of Cahokian or Mississippian style building houses is built in what we call a wall trench. And that's what these blue lines are. After we've excavated, we've identified these things. So these you know, extend farther into the ground. That is where the wall of the house is inserted. And then it goes up. It was probably relatively small kind of saplings woven, to, woven together and then bent over the tops so that the walls kind of gradually turn into the roof here. One thing you'll notice is that we have two sets of walls. So we have this inner set here and then this outer set. So it looks like the house was built um, and, then, and then dismantled, potentially burned down, um, and then rebuilt basically on the same area. Uh, and we see some level of continuity because you notice this little gap here. This appears to be an opening, kind of an entry ramp into the house. They have maintained that uh, through time. So our wall trenches, um, we're a little funky, so let's back up a little bit and talk about wall trenches. We have hundreds, maybe thousands of wall trench structures that have been excavated from Cahokia and other Mississippian sites all throughout the region. And uh, so what you do, you can see here, there's a real basic reenactment that I stole off the internet of somebody making a wall trench. You're digging out 
just a very narrow kind of trench in the ground. You take uh, the walls of your house, set them in. So you can see, you know, wall trenches going on around here. We think our house structurally looked like uh, the upper one there, which is what we call this bent pole structure kind of going through. Well, the thing with wall trenches, and just about all other wall trenches you see in the reconstruction, you see in this, there are four segments of the wall trench, right? And they are not connected. And the corners of these houses probably would have been interwoven and covered uh, with branches, so they're not open corners of the house. Well, we saw that in the, in the first iteration of this house. You have one, two, and presumably we didn't excavate this side yet, but presumably you have them over here as well. But you see the, the next version, the bigger version, they are connected at the corners, which is a highly unusual, almost unheard of way of making wall trenches. Very uh, unique to the site, especially considering uh, everything else we know about Illinois. So that gets to maybe some of our other questions about what's happening here, who are these people, how are they kind of making it work. So we're, after we've identified these things on the surface, we're now cutting into them. So you can see here, this is the inner wall trench. This is one that has these kind of open corners. Here's the outer one. You see it's not quite as deep. It's a little wider. Same thing's happening over on the other side of the house. The, those really deep, narrow trenches that you see in the first one is also highly unusual for what we see of these wall trenches here. So we have potentially different building style, potentially different architecture kind of coming through here as well. So there they are. It's kind of fun to see those side by side. This photo is actually right here. So we saw an intersection between two wall trenches. It looks like the outer one cuts into the inner one. So that would show us that the inner one was there first. Uh, and part of the reason we're saying that this inner smaller wall trench house was, was there first and then it was taken down uh, and then rebuilt as, as a slightly bigger version. So there's a just a uh, different type of cut through the wall trench. You see the depth that this all goes down to. You see a big giant elk uh, scapula kind of popping out of there as well. A couple of, of funky things that we see here. Uh, typically in wall trenches, when you cut them in half this way, they're all essentially the same depth all the way across. And a few places here, this first inner wall trench, um, we saw a few of these places where we see the clay soil as what can best kind of be described as a plug. We're not exactly sure what to make of that, if it's an architectural thing, if it's just kind of a random thing. We're still trying to figure out why exactly somebody would do that. And here's an overall view of that outer wall trench structure. This is one with the connected corners. So you can see that um, the feature exists here. The, the yellow is just the natural kind of subsoil. The more brown is intermixed with cultural material. So we know it's something that was constructed by people in the past. But you can also see it's not as deep as the other wall trench. So structurally, it's not the same thing. Yet it is there. And it's something that people really didn't do uh, anywhere else. So it is very much a, a prominent feature of this particular structure. So there's another kind of up close uh, view of it. This brown spot here that's a, a rodent kind of dug through there. Um, the burrowing animals always kind of muddy things up, but we're still seeing that going all the way across, connecting those two wall trenches. And there's finally one more view, in case you didn't believe the other ones, <laughs> we have that one here. All right, so the other part, a kind of interesting part about the house, is that it has a very clear entry ramp. Uh, which is, this isn't something you see a whole lot of. Typically with wall trench structures, there's no break in the wall trench and we just kind of have to guess uh, where the front door essentially would have been of a house. Here we have this and again, we're keeping it through both construction phases. phases. And you can see here, this is just kind of getting down into the basin. Essentially what they did is they just didn't dig out this ramp. So it's the clay subsoil that serves as you know, the, the welcome mat and the entry ramp down into the house. So there we've cut into it a little bit. You can see a little darkness there of, of I guess, people wiping their feet as, as they're entering the house, kind of compacts the soil there as we go. In the center of the house, found a lot of evidence for, for burning. You think of it as you know, the central fire of the house. You see this orange, uh, red kind of, kind of coloring of the soil here. A number of pits that have all this evidence that they had fires that were so hot, they are changing the color 
of the soil around them. There's just another version of that. A lot of these were, were constructed through. So there's a quick tour of the house in terms of stuff we're finding. Here is some of that Mississippian shell-tempered pottery. You see it all cleaned up on the right, and there is how it looked uh, in the ground on the left. Um, so this would have been, you know, some sort of a jar, probably for cooking, maybe for storage, a very utilitarian thing. There's no real decoration on it. We do find some fancy, what I like to call the fine china. This piece here is from the site. This is not from the site, but this is, is a larger piece that it probably would have looked similar to. You can see it's kind of the edge of this plate. It's a serving ware. Um, so it's, it's more for the you know, kind of visible side of things and not so much for the utilitarian side that we saw with the pots. We see other unique elements. These are all shell tempered. You see a little handle of a jug of something that may have been more like a pitcher. You see another, the uh, top of another pot here. This is half of what we call a spindle whirl. So this would have been fully circular with a hole in the center. These are used in the weaving process. Uh, so they're doing stuff with, with, again, these are made out of fired clay. You can see some shell temper in there as well. So a good amount of this Mississippian pottery through here. And the question is, okay, we have some of this, um, but um, where is it coming from? You know, not a whole lot of it. Is it. It's possible that they may be traded for it. But we also have some chunks of uh, shell from within the house here. That's the white stuff you see here. And a couple of spots where we have rocks kind of sitting on top. And you see this rock here, a hammer stone. So you can easily kind of imagine somebody sitting there with a pile of shell, crushing it up to mix it in with the pottery uh, itself. So we have now a good story to tell maybe uh, where they're maybe making some of this shell tempered pottery on site. We also have a lot of, of the Langford pottery as well. That's the vast majority. Uh, of what we see. We also have some, some stone uh, tools. Uh, the bow and arrow is the big hunting and um, warfare weapon that we see. So we find all these triangular points uh, from the site. Um, we have several hundred. Uh, word is several thousand of these have been collected of, of, off the surface of the site uh, through the years. We also have some other stone tools for more kind of heavy duty woodworking. Uh, you see little, you know, axes, celts, uh, think of like a little hatchet. Now we have here some trade goods. Uh, this is pottery. So we have a rolled, or pottery, copper, excuse me. Uh, we have copper here. You see a rolled copper bead, uh, which copper naturally occurs. Some of the biggest natural copper deposits on earth are, are up in the, uh, uh, or near Lake Superior in the upper peninsula of Michigan. Uh, so that's coming down here, potentially through Cahokia, or maybe directly acquired by the people themselves. So we have this rolled copper bead that would have been part of a necklace or maybe worn on clothing. Uh, we have this copper rod here, uh, for lack of a better term. It may have had another pointy end on it uh, used in, for, for making stone tools or, or uh, leather working, something like that. Lots of bones. You see here, here's a big giant elk uh, molar. Um, and you see some, some deer jaws over there. You see the little uh, delicate uh, bone needle. You see the, the very end of it's all been polished up uh, and blackened uh, for use in sewing or maybe in holding a garment together through there as well. And, and all sorts of additional artifacts that we're still sifting through in the lab. So let's revisit, okay, wh what are we doing here? And, and and um, what have we learned after a season or so of excavation? So we're seeing things that are completely new. We're seeing people who are, are building the house with these kind of corner connected wall trenches that are moving through. So we have um, potentially this idea that as these new people are getting together, they're potentially forming these new traditions that are in this case maybe reflected by um, this, this building of this house here. So we can call this the big fancy word of the day, ethnogenesis. Change over time, well, we see that right here again with the house. We know that the house started a little smaller and, and in a different construction technique, and then it's expanded and built in a different way. How much you know, longer after that is, is hard to say, or whether or not all the other houses look like that. Uh, at this time, it's also hard to say. It'll just take more work uh, here as well. And ultimately, we'll keep building towards these questions 
as well as other big questions about why in the world people are here and how are they making it work when we have different types of folks coming together.